Um, well, thank you everybody for, for joining us today. I'm sure some people might be, be still trickling through, but um, we've got a lot of content, so um, eager to kick off. Um, I'm going to start just by introducing Lynchpin. Um, we're an independent analytics consultancy founded in 2005 in the UK. Our independence is very important to us. It enables us to provide a balanced and neutral view um, and focus solely on what is our client's best interests. Our capabilities span data science, data engineering, strategy, um, and this enables us to customize our approach to each client's unique situation and requirements. Uh, and then utilizing that depth and breadth, breadth and capabilities, we offer a wide range of services from data analytics and strategy, digital analytics tagging, data integration and automation, um, marketing analytics, um, including advanced analytics such as marketing attribution and, and personalization services, just, just to name a few. Um, as I said, thank you so much for you all coming to this panel discussion today. Um, myself and Gary will be moderating and we'll introduce ourselves um, a little bit in, and then the panelists will also introduce themselves. Um, our panelists here today are leading thinkers in marketing and analytics, um, and they will share their experiences in building an analytics led culture within their organizations. Um, it's fair to say with a, a backdrop of changing technologies, we're often faced with challenges in keeping up with the pace. Uh, there's now so much more data collection points. Um, we also need to balance that with the concerns about privacy and consent. And analytics, advanced analytics is now becoming an expectation alongside traditional BI. Um, so the landscape is wide and varied, um, but the importance in taking action is still uh, now more important than, than ever. So during our conversation today, we'll be looking to understand those challenges um, that organizations face and how we can establish an analytics strategy to, to lead to better decision-making and drive impact throughout our organization. Um, I'll hand over to Gary now, who can introduce himself. Okay, um, just a brief introduction, because I, I guess you're keen to understand the panel and, and not the moderators, but um, so I, uh, with Anne, work at Lynchpin Analytics. I head up the strategy and engineering sides of the business. Uh, my background very quickly is both agency and client side um, and a lot of analytics roles, primarily in financial services. However, I happen to think that um, the challenges we face in BI analytics and data are fairly universal, um, particular challenges in financial services, yes, but every industry has their own uh, challenges, whether it's regulation or, or some other considerations. Um, so that's me. And I'm Anne, also I head up the, the data science team within, in, uh, within Lynchbin. Um, got a background a very long time ago in maths, physics and, and statistics. Um, I originally worked consultancy side in Ireland um, for a company called SBSS um, with a core focus on advanced analytics um, and then moved client side in 2004. Um, working across multiple industries, um, but then came back to came back to consultancy in 2013, and have been working with with Lynchpin ever since um, across the range of a range of services that we mentioned earlier. Um, Great. So I wonder if we can get on. Thanks, Anne. I wonder if we get onto the panel and do some quick introductions. If we could get the panelists to intro themselves, if I could ask if you don't mind keeping it to 60 seconds or less. Um, because an awful lot to get through, um, but it'd be good for the, the audience to hear. So if we can start with Prajul, if you wouldn't mind, and then Adil, and then Jacob, and then Sunal. So Prajul. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all, uh, the entire team, for having me over here today. Uh, I've been handling uh, digital marketing for the healthcare industry since the uh, past four years. Uh, I've been coming from a, a background of complete agency side in terms of uh, marketing, uh, branding, and creative. Uh, it's been a while uh, that, you know, uh, coming back to healthcare is uh, completely changed the way of how the whole marketing and the digital system is uh, worked around. Uh, yeah, that's a small introduction. Thanks, Pajul. Um, Adil? 
everyone, Adil Ahmed. Um, I'm a software engineer. I did my software engineering and then I did my MBA in marketing. Um, throughout my career, I have been in brand management and marketing. Um, I spent 13 years with Procter & Gamble. And uh, in the past two years, I joined Nahdi Medical Company. It's one of the leading pharmacy chains here in Saudi. Um, and we have recently ventured into primary care uh, polyclinics as well. Um, I am here uh, marketing uh, director, looking over uh, all the marketing um, initiatives. Thank you so much for having me in the panel. Obviously, from a software engineering background, I have real passion for data information. And I really believe that really, um, in order to enter into the next phase of marketing, um, adoption and um, utilization of uh, for cutting at, uh, edge technology and data is critical, uh, not just for the marketeers, but also for um, the guests or the consumers whom we are trying to serve. So really looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Leo. Um, Jacob? Hey, uh, well, basically uh, to share with the team, uh, um, two uh, decades of experience, uh, particularly in the EMEA region and GCC. Um, currently affiliated with Doha Bank as the head of marketing uh, for um, Qatar and all retail operations and correspondent offices all over the world. And uh, I'm a chairman and founder of uh, Jacob International Group, which is uh, based in Poland with uh, uh, offices and subsidiaries in France and uh, Spain, Portugal, and uh, Bulgaria. Uh, in particular, my experience is in research, product development, integrate comms, marketing, digital transformation, and change management. So that's in a nutshell. Okay, thanks, Jacob. Uh, Sonal. Yeah, hi, this is Sonal Dara. I actually uh, head sales and marketing at uh, Dubai National Insurance and Insurance, which is part of Al Haptur Group. Uh, so my background is like 17 years of agency experience, uh, which is more of uh, client servicing, brand management, uh, creatives, uh, media planning, and then uh, shifted to uh, the insurance industry four years back. Uh, started with the, as the marketing head, and last year I got promoted as the sales head. Uh, which is B2B and B2C. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, strategic partnerships that, uh, you know, I've uh, got into and opened various uh, sales channels in the company. And, uh, and how we link it to today's discussion is what I'm going to be talking about. And uh, great to be here. And thank you, everyone. Thanks, Mel. Um, so it's a great panel. Quite good range of experience here on the panel. I think the audience is in for a treat. Uh, it's quite an exciting topic as well, and um, so I think let's get started. Um, I think I guess uh, just just to say as well, if you've got any questions, please post it in the chat, and we'll pick them up at the end, uh, as Mark said. But I guess I'd like to start by making uh, reference to um, the acceleration of BI over the last few years. So I've seen more companies investing more in analytics and investing more in BI capability. And there's often various triggers for that. You know, it could be digital transformation, it could be COVID, it could be something else. Um, uh, but certainly there's been a, a change over the past few years uh, into um, becoming data-driven organizations. Um, so to start off, I'd like to go across the group. Um, perhaps I'd like to start with, with the deal. I guess I'd like to understand how you and your company is investing in a BI strategy uh, and what's really led your business to move in that direction. Uh, and I know, Adil, um, you're building an ecosystem, you know, that um, your customers can access. And I know you've talked to me about that before. So just keen to understand a bit about that. And if you can go across the panel, uh, that would be great. Sure. Thank you so much, Gary. So um, basically here at Nadi, as I told, uh, as I said earlier, that we are a leading pharmacy, pharmacy chain, a pharmacy chain company. Um, we have been here since the past 35 years. And as Gary mentioned, that the landscape has fastly evolving, both in terms of um, how we are operating, as well as the expectations of our guests. So we call our consumers our guests. Um, and based on that, if you look at the overall landscape, the healthcare landscape here, it's a bit fragmented. So you have these big hospitals, you have these different pharmacy chains. But purely from a guest standpoint, if you were to solve the issues from a healthcare ecosystem standpoint, there is no transparent view. There is no one view. So if you have this vision, that you want to really create that health and well-being ecosystem for the guests, then um, 
we need integration of multiple systems that have been here since the legacy times. And, and I'd like to also highlight a couple of challenges that we face because you know there are different systems that are there um, with different sets of data and as well as utilizing different processes. And when you're trying to orchestrate this ecosystem, and already if you're an Omni Health provider, then the first challenge that you face is how do we really get this all integrated and up to speed for the final one view of the guests that we want to create in order to really serve them better. And when I say better from a marketing standpoint, how can we really reach out to them in a personalized way? How can we create? So one thing is content creation, but another thing is how do we reach out to them on their receptivity touch points when they're really willing to listen to us or when they're really about to make a transaction? How can we be more efficient? And there are lots of triggers that come in place. So there can be some external triggers that impact your ecosystem that you're trying to envision. Like for example, this unprecedented pandemic situation that all of us faced, I'm sure you guys would have also felt that this pandemic one, if I were to take out the silver lining or the beneficial outcome that came out of the pandemic was that it advanced the future in so many ways. If the, if the companies were planning, okay, we will enter into e-commerce or home yeah. and all of that, there were so many services, IT-driven and analytical-driven services that we, had to, that we had to really launch ASAP. So for a project that used to take like two years, we had to launch it in a matter of uh, two, three months in order to meet that heightened expectations of the guests. So, so I believe that yes, um, in order to orchestrate such an ecosystem, uh, we will continue to utilize. And I think um, analytics and AI will continue to be the heart of the strategy closely integrated and working with the business teams. That's how I, at least I look at it. Thanks, Dil. <laughs> so now I wonder if you could talk through how, how your business is going through a BI strategy. Yeah, uh, okay, so I, uh, I'm taking on from the point which she mentioned uh, right now about COVID. Uh, COVID actually taught us how to get digitalized because before that, especially from an insurance industry point of view, it was very conventional, you know? I mean, uh, insurance is all about service. And uh, for insurance sales, it's very important for a customer to have, you know, uh, offline sales are also very important, like direct walk-ins of the customer. So you have a lot of broker, broker channel being one of the most important channel for an insurance trustee for sales. You have brokers who actually, uh, you know, uh, get customers to walk in and close, uh, you know, issue policies for them. Now, what happened with COVID was work from home. You know, so uh, there was a lockdown and, you know, that's when people realized that even without face-to-face -face interaction with the customer, you can actually close the uh, an issue policies, close deals. That's when the aggregator market started booming. So you had a lot of aggregators who started having the major market share, uh, you know, who started taking major market share. And all the uh, brokers realized after a certain point of time, it's very important to get into online. And they started uh, opening a lot of websites for getting in online inquiries. So their own website, they started integrating, uh, they start, APIs came into the picture. So API is something we've all been talking about for the last three to four years, but only after COVID is when this integration actually started, uh, you know, people started executing and started investing into it, including ourselves. So uh, that is one aspect. Uh, so that is one of the challenges. So what we've actually got into uh, because of COVID and we have a changed management now because that's another challenge. It's very important uh, for the, the, the staff and the management to accept the change, you know, uh, because people are resistant to change in an organization. So especially your senior management has to be actually, uh, you know, uh, made aware of the, uh, the pros and the cons and the, the effectiveness uh, of this, uh, you know, or changing into uh, digital uh, the digital transformation. So it's very important to give them the ROIs and the, uh, the productivity, the efficiency, because if you actually tell them the main objective, it's about seamless customer experience. And that's all, uh, that's every service industry that aims for. That's also one of our, it's a vision of our company. So for a seamless customer experience and to enhance the productivity, it's very important for a quick turnaround time. For a quick turnaround time, it's very important to invest in different technology uh, to ensure that immediate policy issuance is given for the customer. It's all about speed uh, at the rate at which you service the customer uh, you know, uh, quickly. So this is uh, some of the challenges that we had faced, but now we've overcome these challenges because of the changed management who's, who accepts digital transformation as one of the key factors to growth and to cus uh, seamless customer experience. And uh, we are looking at a lot of uh, models like uh, we have uh, 
you know, uh, I worked on a lot of portals, you know, for B2B and uh, B2C. Uh, we've actually made uh, on our website, we have online policy issuance now. So there's a lot of way where we, though you cannot eliminate human interaction completely, uh, especially when it's a, a product which is around 2000 dirhams or more. But, uh, you know, and people, uh, you need uh, human interaction. But I think it's very important to give that quick customer uh, uh, service uh, to, uh, to the customer. So this is what we are looking at, uh, digital transformation, and how we could, uh, you know, use technology to create uh, a customer database. We've also come up with a contact center uh, now. Uh, so this contact center actually uses CRM to be able to build the data. So uh, for an insurance industry, as everyone understands, data is very important, whether it's for the underwriters, for the, you know, to understand the, 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 the claims history or whether it's for pricing or whether it's for, uh, you know, uh, the, for the sales to actually, uh, you know, analyze the data. So uh, this is exactly why it's very important to get, uh, currently, uh, previously we were having manual data, you know, uh, fed in the system by, you know, uh, for data entry or by the salespeople at the showrooms or the broker offices which was uh it was very erroneous so you know it was uh, at least 50 percent of the data was wrong numbers or wrong email contact details now with with the new crm system that we have through this contact center which takes care of all the uh, you know uh, customer interface is uh, where we they actually feed in all the data so it's 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 more personalized so if anybody calls you next you know they get the information whether it's one agent or the next agent they will exactly know who's the person who's calling when did he call before and what is the, is, is it that the customer wants so i think uh, this is where we are moving towards personalized customer experience and as we go forward i'll speak more about it yeah great thanks thanks now um Prajul, i guess we've heard there and um, covid has been a common trigger for for both the, the previous panelists there have you, have you seen that as a, a trigger um, or, or what else has been a factor for you? Of course, of course. Uh, COVID has been a, a big change to every single industry. I guess we all agree on that. And especially to the healthcare, it was it, it was an overnight changes in everything. We the way we function, the way we handle things, and everything was completely changed and overnight. And we, as a marketer also, we had to change ourselves uh, and the, the pace. I think Adil also mentioned uh, over, over uh, previously, you know, some of the, uh, uh, some of the ideas or some of the implementation uh, took some time. But then when, when the COVID hit, I think everything what we did was on a faster pace. Uh, I mean, you know, in the same way how it went with the vaccine as well, uh, you know, back in the days. Could, uh, to get the vaccine, it could take you, uh, you know, a lot of years. But you know, things are moving in a very fast way. In the same way, for us also, uh, when it comes to the healthcare industry, it's one of the largest, largest, and the most complex uh, industry in uh, in in the Middle East. What I mean, uh, complex, is because uh, it's it's one of the most difficult for the marketer to uh, operate and understand and uh, come up with the ideas and and the strategies. Uh, due to the large number of data we collect uh, over uh, different campaigns of marketing activities, it could be of your uh, uh, from your uh, websites, could be from your search engines, from your social media, from your online uh, review forms, and also the hospital and the clinic itself. You collect a huge number of data, and it's important. And it's the most important is how do we utilize these data to actually turn into a conversion. Uh, so, uh, what what basically is uh, analytic for for healthcare, and uh, it's basically how the healthcare marketer overcome all the challenges in terms of the data depth, diversity, and the fluidity. Uh, using these uh, uh, using these channels, we marketers can get an idea and try to translate in them into an action, which can be used and uh, improved on the real uh, decision making and. We also face a lot of challenges uh, in terms of these data as well. So uh, we, we always focus on the uh, growth marketing part of it and also the uh, content marketing. Video content plays a very important role for us. Uh, video has always been more engaging for us and uh, it's been a major uh, part of communication between uh, the end users. I think Prajil might be frozen. Um, 
we're keen to come back to that. Um, Jacob, I wonder if you mind talking uh -huh. through um, BI strategies from, from your perspective and you know triggers and, and challenges related to that. Well, actually, um, um, as I recollect, if I look five, six years backwards and um, um, I look at the, the change management approach to uh, digital was um, basically focused on enhancing the, uh, the cost. So looking at cost reductions, um, looking at omni customer experience. So this means transaction mapping across several touch points, uh, looking at straight through processing of transactions and enhancing the turnaround times for the customers. So I think it was evolving and revolving around uh, these small um, KPIs. However, now, um, if we look at the impact of um, the technology developments, uh, we've seen that cloud solutions have started to um, impact every single business line, every single traditional business line. It started to impact uh, um, the way we operate daily, whether it is uh, through our entertainment, whether through healthcare, banking, insurance services. So uh, likewise in banking, the same is happening. So you've seen fintechs come in, um, they are more agile, rounded companies with uh, enhanced uh, turnaround times for delivery, uh, less um, the things that, that are major in these companies that they are very resilient and young and, and rounded in terms of their operations. Mm -hmm. So um, these companies start to um, create an impact in the market. And this applies to banking and every single vertical mm -hmm. in every single industry. So um, the things that we can look at in a nutshell, for example, in terms of technology, we can look at the blockchain technology, uh, mm -hmm. which is um, impacting, for example, the auditing companies. It's impacting the supply chain management uh, and how we uh, transport food. Um, the impact of, for instance, uh, uh, the uh, robots and uh, chatbots mm -hmm. coming in for customer service and marketing. So we are operating in that environment and certainly we are impacted with all of this. So banks in particular and um, companies in services now find themselves operating in an environment where uh, operations is not actually owned totally by the, um, it's not a propriety of the company delivering the service. So we can talk about operations, uh, operating without operations. So uh, if you're looking at the customer experience also, you're looking at multi-touch points, you're looking at a three, uh, what we call the triadic business space. We're looking at transactions through brick and mortars, digital and social. And certainly this creates a lot of opportunities for the banks and for services industries because they're sitting on tons of data. And this is what I would call um, the, the new oil industry for us. This is the high asset value for us. So banks started to understand that without understanding um, the, the data you're sitting on or having a business intelligence strategy around it, where you structure it in folders, where you make it accessible for everybody without creating silos of decision making or different uh, KPIs. We talked always about balanced scorecard, but I think once you have a proper business intelligence strategy, you can have a proper um, you know, contribution towards a unified balanced scorecard. So this is where we start to find it very pressing to uh, actually process this data. So previously, uh, the, the customer would transact through the teller. Now you have, we talked about uh, omni-channel customer experience, and now you're talking about interactions across multiple platforms. This means more data. This means the, um, the uh, transacting uh, process is actually very different. The customer journey is very different. So he can actually uh, pick up from where he left last time on a mobile application or he's moved to an online uh, platform, then he visited the branch, then called the call center. So um, definitely having a business intelligence strategy around the data that we have and mapping it properly with the customer journeys is, is something that's indispensable at this point in time. So this is, I think, how we have decided gradually to become not only forced adopters of technology, but also um, uh, we are forced um, to really um, take the customer expectations and the new ecosystem that we work with as the new norms. Uh, this is how I would put it best. 
So um, this is what it's what basically is pressing actually um, banks, likewise any other service industry, to to transform and and to to adopt these intelligence strategies because data is actually the new um, super valued asset that we sit on. Uh, thanks, Jacob. Um, I guess what we're hearing is there's, you know, we're hearing a lot of the opportunity that comes from a BI strategy. We talked a bit about kind of advanced analytics. We talked about customer expectation. Um, I just want to talk briefly about um, culture and, you know, just how we might get this right in the business. Um, I guess I'd like to understand maybe, for example, what companies might be doing this well um, and, and what makes them do it well. But just picking up a point, you mentioned earlier, Sanal, you talked about, um, I guess you talked about leadership and giving them ROI of, of, an, um, of analytics. But I guess, what what do, qualities do we expect of leaders? I mean, what does a good leader give us? And, and I'm just trying to understand a bit about company culture and a good leader and what, what they give us to help drive forward with a, a good BI strategy. Uh, so I feel that, uh, you know, uh, the, the experience that uh, the, the leader uh, has, so we, uh, the good leader would be somebody who would understand, adapt to changes instantly. Uh, they understand the need of the hour, they understand the, the vision of the company, which is uh, seamless customer experience. And, uh, you know, so we have a, a leaders who actually believe in fintech. Uh, you know, like uh, Mr. Jacob was talking about. So uh, these are uh, like, even though they're startup companies, it's, uh, you know, the whole pool is like about using the resources to actually enhance your customer experience, use such technologies. Exactly. Uh, so and there's one more very important thing, uh, realizing the fact that, you know, you, you need to go step by step towards building your, uh, towards the digital transformation. So it's, uh, so we do not expect companies to invest you know, uh, millions of dollars in uh, digital transformation immediately. Uh, like I mentioned initially, we, we're looking at APIs to start with because aggregators are what is coming up in the insurance industry and they need immediate policy issu issuance. So uh, we need to connect with, talk to their systems, connect with them directly so that, uh, you know, through our systems, the policy can be issued immediately. Uh, same way we're dealing with TPAs when it comes to, uh, you know, medical health insurance, uh, where we're doing direct integration. So medical health insurance is something where the, uh, the tax, the turnaround time is, is, is an issue, is like a, con a cause of concern currently. So that's where we, even the TPAs, whether you call them MedNet, NextGen, as they're all working towards, uh, you know, system integrations, where they actually open to having discussions with the brokers, aggregators, insurance companies to, uh, you know, uh, have all the systems integrated in order to for immediate uh, policy issuance. So uh, these are the things and the, uh, you know, the, the, the leaders understanding this, uh, you know, uh, background and, uh, you know, ready to invest step by step. More importantly, apart from the uh, external uh, technology, also internally, the core system through which the, uh, you know, the policy is issued or the customer data is captured needs to be also uh, updated. So uh, that is a process that we're working on simultaneously. And this is what our leaders uh, do understand currently. Okay, keen to hear from the, uh, anyone else in the panel has got, got some thoughts there on, on leadership and how that helps support uh, a successful BI strategy. Any more thoughts? Yes, um, Gary, if you'd allow me very yes, quickly. Sir. I think the biggest expectation from any business leader is to ask the right questions. Because what we want really from data and business intelligence and IT capability is how we can turn that data into insights that can really support um, the business. So asking the right questions, given the evolving external context, as well as understanding the internal realities of the company, I think can create magic for companies. And that's where the culture part comes in. And if you ask me, given the, as Jacob was also mentioning, the speed of digital transformation and the fact that it's now not a choice, I think it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity for the business intelligence team, the analytics or the IT as they are termed broadly in any company, IT department to practically take over companies. Because if they really integrate themselves, as Sonal was also mentioning, in terms of really integrating the KPIs and 
if we are able to remove those silos that have been traditionally there within the culture, I think we can produce magic because then imagine having conversations where your IT person or your business analytics person, they're coming to you and they're enabling you on business KPIs. For example, if you want to increase your high value guest segments, you want to increase your sales, you want to deliver your strategic marketing or commercial objectives, all of this can be de a a delivered with um, in innovative ways. And then eventually it can bring in good business value and ROI and everything that we have discussed. So I think very important thing is to ask the right questions and then having an integrated culture where you know the, the IT or the analytics team is really on top of the business and you can have integrated KPIs. One thing that I've seen from my experience, even from Procter & Gamble and here uh, at Nadi as well is, when you have and then the, the different functions like the business teams, commercial is trying to add that value and naturally you get rid of those silos. So it is very important. And I think it's a challenge for the, I'd see many IT people who have joined here from, from, from IT background and analytics background. So I think it's a challenge because you have to keep yourself up to pace with the technology. At the same time, you need to know what's happening on the business so that you can give that input and you can really help the deliver the KPIs um, that the business is setting. And then you can be at the forefront in terms of bringing in ideas, how we can bring efficiency in the entire value chain. So I uh, coming from, sorry, coming from uh, Adil's uh, discussion, he was mentioning that IT should take over. There's a very hot topic going on currently. Uh, is it CMO going to be the new CEO or CIO going to be the new CEO? So uh, I think for, for uh, what he said in the the end was like uh, apt because it's the both the business and the uh, you know the uh, IT the operations which play a role hand in hand to actually uh, and which is instrumental in the growth of the company. So I think now that um, coming from my uh, you know from the company that I work in, uh, the the current CEO is actually with a background of both. So we are looking forward to like uh, increased uh, you know uh, quick uh, growth in the future uh, based on digital transformation at a uh, fast speed. Um, thanks, Sanal. Um, I guess um, you touched on there, um, Adil, you were talking quite a bit there about um, organizational silos. Um, and I wonder if it's useful to talk about uh, data, which is you know, a core aspect of, of a, a BI strategy. Um, and I think previously some, someone has talked about kind of cloud and so on as well. Um, it'd be good to understand about um, data within a business. And Hi. Um, perhaps, um, Prajul, I know that you're working in, you know, in, in healthcare and there might be some regulation around that. I wonder if you could maybe talk through um, how that's impacted your thoughts on data um, and perhaps the, the role of data within a, within a BI strategy. Well, yeah, uh, like I mentioned earlier as well, I mean, uh, the amount of data we collect, uh, it's, it's, it's humongous on a daily basis. So when we try to do uh, use it from the back end to make it into a conversion, the biggest challenge we face, uh, face is because uh, UAE being uh, one of the biggest expat country uh, for us targeting those people back again, uh, it's quite challenging. Uh, it's, it's only because uh, uh, people tend to uh, move out from country and uh, these data may not be useful for us anymore. Uh, keep, uh, people change countries, people uh, change their numbers and, uh, you know, uh, these kind of challenges. And also, we have uh, strict uh, rules and regulations on from the authorities on, on the kind of uh, languages slash the, the phrase or the images we, we use. And uh, so we slowly move from the old school wave of, on, from the uh, advertising to more of the video content, which is more into... Uh, testimonials and uh, you know more more which can actually interact uh, and make uh, someone feel more comfortable uh, because uh, these kind of things uh, can uh, can be quite hard for us uh, in terms of uh, what we what we want to portray so uh, like i mentioned also uh, video plays the biggest role for us that's for sure um Jacob, you talked previously about cloud. I wonder if you would, wouldn't mind talking through 
the impact of, of cloud technology or on data and then on, on BI? Uh, I didn't get you clearly. You mentioned the impact of? Yes, sorry, just mentioning that you had previously talked about cloud um, technologies and just keen to understand what you think the impact there is on, on data, data collection, governance and so on, and, and the impact of that in BI strategies. Okay, I'm not sure if I heard you properly. So basically, you're asking me about the digital impact in terms of data aggregation, or you're asking me about the data strategy itself? No, aggregation. The data aggregation? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, well, uh, basically, you know, of course, we're aggregating now from multiple sources and um, with wearable technologies coming in and with the interactions, as we mentioned, on several platforms, uh, whether through online or physical or even social, where I think the biggest challenge in social in particular would be um, uh, actually uh, de-anonymizing the uh, people there. And I think the second challenge would be in terms of data aggregation is making sure that you can actually create one unified profile for that specific customer across all these touch points. And this is where uh, I believe in the future you're going to see, and actually not in the future now, um, you have to identify in your customer journeys the specific primary keys. So for example, if you're talking about uh, the, the um, the customer profile number or ID number, if it's a government body or basically an account number in a bank, has the key source for sourcing that data. And from uh, the perspective of uh, data management, I think the uh, before I talk about the marketing aspect, once we're aggregating all this data and understanding how we can de-anonymize, because I think this is the biggest challenge to make sure that you have all the, in addition to the transactional data, the behavioral and uh, uh, predictive uh, informations that you generate from behavioral data that you have, is uh, looking how you can uh, put that data in a meaningful structure. This means putting the strategy in a meaningful structure where you can store it, manage it, share it, and actually um, enable the business team to strategize around it. So the, the core definition in my opinion of data strategy is making sure how you can deploy that data into an actual business strategy. So uh, if you ask me from a marketing perspective, certainly we now we've seen what's happening on, um, um, there's pressure on all of us as marketeers uh, with the uh, third party cookies, you know, weighing in and, and you know, like a lot of um, uh, companies now are struggling to keep up with the next, um, um, next level of how they're going to have a single customer view. So how come we're going to bridge also on top of the single customer view that customer experience? So I think we're, we're really late, um, uh, to be honest with you, and, and it's not going to be that easy. So first, you have a lot of sources of content, a lot of sources for data aggregation, but the data management and making sure you map it to a specific customer view and having that uh, view mapped into the actual strategy of the company and delivering an engaging experience is something that all companies need to look at. And this is across retail, across every single uh, uh, industry, I believe, in the future. Um, that's why we need artificial intelligence and robotics coming in because you have uh, robotic process engineering because with all this data, I doubt that any um, um, you know, regular human mind can process all of this and create all the correlations, which will give you the cognitions moving forward in developing your uh, business. Some some really interesting points you raised towards the, the end there, Jacob. Um, I wonder if I can just point this, this pick up from that, but point this next question at, at um, a deal. Um, you know, with all of this new data, but with also the, the implications around some of this, this changing um, life cycle of first party cookie data, for example, um, a lot of people are talking a lot more about the ethics of, of dealing with the data collection and what we do with the data afterwards. Um, do you think that the data governance or ownership has, has evolved within your business to keep up with that pace? And, and how do you guys manage that, that data governance um, and those conversations internally? Sure, I think this is, being in healthcare, this is of utmost importance on how we are um, collecting the data and how we are um, making sure that it is properly governed, what are the dates and dates and what are the locks and the keys. Uh, 
um, and who's handling what. So this determination of roles and responsibilities clear and how we are accessing the, this data is very important. And I think I also want to touch upon and link to the previous discussion where yes, we have a lot of sources of data. Um, important thing is to have the business clarity from the leader. This links us back to what we expect from the leader and not just the leader, even from the working team and the business team, because I believe everyone in the leader, even when you start off in a company in your work scope, you're a leader. The point is we have to be clear as businesses that throughout the customer journey, throughout the uh, customer lifecycle journey, what is the value that me as, for example, Nahdi Medical Company or a pharmacy or a clinic, what is the role that I will play in each part of the journey? What is the value that I'm going to add? If I'm clear on that value and my role as a partner, um, for example, our campaign, one of the equity campaigns we have is there for every beat. So and it has a lot of implications because that means that I'm closely with you when you need me. So that's where the guest understanding comes in. Guess that, that's where the guest centricity comes in where you understand, okay, this is the entire journey. This is the role that I will play as Nahdi in this journey. And these are the interruption points. Then you will be able to sift through and avoid what is analysis paralysis. Obviously the governance um, of data, the checks and balance and everything has to be there, but the utilization um, um, comes from the clarity of what value you want to add to your guest lives and how will you make it an enriching experience so that even it is not seen as an invasion of prior privacy. So now these days, it's not just about personalization, but it's also about hyper-personalization where you actually know that there is a mother who usually orders on a Saturday and that's where she opens the app. So what if I just figure this, um, this notification on the app and this will ease her process of selecting what she wants and give her the best value at the same time generating a personalized offer, you know? So I just drafted a scenario where you can be hyper-personalized towards the guest. And this links us again to all the data collection that we're doing here uh, as Nadi, because we have the first party data as well, because, you know, for us, it's, it's so clear because we do transaction-based rest profiling because we have millions of transactions that happen across. So it's not claim, it's not like, okay, it's based on interest, but it is based on something. No, it's based on actual transactions. So even if it is a male profile, and if there is a, let's say a baby care, a diaper product that is getting purchased, I know that there is a baby behind there, right? So I can truly precisely target or communicate with that person, uh, a baby care offer or something, depending on, again, the hyper-personalized scenario that you create for the golden record of that guest. And then I can, uh, without uh, doing any privacy invasion, we see this as facilitating our guests and how we are adding that value across the journey um, throughout their lives. That's how we are trying to implement it. Obviously, saying this is easy, but then again, the challenges that we identified at the start of the conversation in integrating these systems and coming up with the one view of the guests, um, this is a challenge that we need to continue break, again, uh, working closely with the analytics and IT teams. Fantastic. So I guess, you know, a lot of what we've discussed around new technologies, cloud-based applications, having to adapt to COVID and, and change that pace um, is sort of naturally leading us to a lot of the, the BI and the analytics that we're doing these days is more advanced, is relying on that personalization. We're adapting to the expectations of, of our audience um, and needing to do that quite quickly. Um, so, um, Prajul, I know you got cut off a little bit earlier. Would you like to, to lead some conversations around the advanced analytics that you're doing within, within your company and maybe talk about some of the successes or challenges? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so what, what, we, what we actually do uh, when it comes to overall after clicking on this thing is like, you know, we plan our campaign way much in advance. We try to uh, simplify and distinguish between the, all the different kinds of data and we try to focus only on that specific kind of uh, target audience. Uh, we try to do uh, all our campaigns in terms in, in different languages because we have, uh, you know, patients from all over the country, all over the world. We try to uh, communicate them in different languages. Uh, and most importantly, we try to make... Uh, all our content mobile friendly because um, everything over over now is 
uh, you know, people, uh, a normal search is done to a, a mobile, mobile device or a smart device. So we try to do everything that implements to the mobile, uh, the way the mobile contents and uh, uh, creative advertising plays a very important role for us uh, due to, uh, like I mentioned earlier, that uh, you know uh, some of the images we cannot uh, we cannot use it because it is not allowed to use it in part, this part of the country. So we try to use a different image, and then we try to communicate that what you actually want to communicate to them. Thanks, thanks for that, Prajil. I know there's there's quite a lot going on within. Um some of your other organizations. So now would you like to, to talk yeah. a little bit about Actually, uh, I was, I, actually, I was just listening to everybody and uh, the hyper-personalization thing I wanted to stress upon, there are two aspects to it. One is there are a lot of marketing platforms uh, that are available. So, uh, you know, which actually you can, uh, in the market that actually leads to, you know, uh, segmenting the data and processing it to the right channel through this, uh, you know, uh, uh, marketing platform, which has, uh, which is AI enabled, you can easily uh, make out that which channel works for which group of customers you can call them your star customers you can call them customers who need to be worked upon who are not buying your uh, you know product so uh, there's a lot uh, of and personalized uh, you know like uh, uh, adil was saying personalized uh, offers and personalized messages could go it could actually tell you when they visited why they visited so thank you for your next uh, you know your second visit and this is the next discount we give you or whatever you know so it's it's hyper personal it's only after we actually uh, you know, uh, get this data, uh, the, the accurate data put in this platform and through AI, we uh, directing it to the right channels. Uh, how do we, uh, you know, analyze this data? How do we study this data is the second most important thing. We have a dashboard called ClickView that we work with. So all the, uh, you know, uh, booked policies or all the customers that we've converted, we actually uh, study this data to see, uh, for example, motor. We actually study to see, are we, is it the four wheel drives that we're closing? Is it the two wheel drives that we're closing? Is it the saloon that we are, you know, uh, uh, we, we have more saloon customers, which nationality, which age band, this really helps us in the pricing strategy. So we know that, you know, uh, you know, uh, through and also studying the claims along with the, you know, uh, the policy issuance data, we also, uh, we analyze the loss ratio and we, uh, the, we do the risk analysis and we decide that uh, which segment is more profitable for us and which segment, so where we could reduce the price further and we could, you know, increase the volumes there. So uh, that's why when we come up with a motor pricing strategy, it's not like we don't look at increasing the prices overall or re reducing the prices overall, because uh, along, along with top line, bottom line is also very important. The profits need to be maintained. So what we do is we uh, see where we're actually making profits and there we uh, try and reduce the, uh, it, it's a very price sensitive market for any uh, industry and especially for insurance now, especially after COVID when insurance authority had come up with like 50% discounts for you know all frontliners and everybody with no claims. So it's very important to study your data correctly using such dashboards and uh, you know reduce your price or give the maximum advantage to the customer wherever applicable. So you actually getting your top line and maintaining your bottom line. So this is what we are working towards now. Fantastic, thanks Sanal. I'm very, very conscious of time and I know there's a few questions that have, have come through on the chat. Um, so I think I'll reflect on a couple of those and then maybe we can come back to sort of a, everybody can give a few key points and a, and a wrap up uh, of the conversation today. Um, so a question from Kareem. Um, I'm going to throw this out to the entire panel because it doesn't look like it's been um, specifically addressed to anybody. How can we be sure if we're making the right interpretation of data of the business reality around us through business intelligence? Um, would anybody like to, to pick that up? Sure, I think um, um, one critical thing is that you do verify it and, um, and you have to ver verify it from multiple sources. Um, and, you know, important thing is because at times you are making critical business decisions and we have to be really wary of um, it has to make sense which is where you know the, the integration of different sources of data also puts up a combined view so for example i may have my internal revenues i may have my internal uh, revenues that are showing me a direction but it has to be 
again, recap with an external view, for example, how am I doing on market share? How am I doing? Um, and it has to match uh, with a certain variance, of course, because the two different data sources cannot be exact. But I think verification from independent um, data sources and then combining it together into one business view is something that always helps because we cannot have one blind eye or we cannot just look internally or just look externally. Um, both these views are very important. I just gave a very simple example, but this can be applied to different data sources um, that are there. I hope I've answered the question. Sound good to me. Thanks, Sadio. Yeah, um, a question earlier on um, from Professor Siddick. I think he wants to ask a question. If you could ask the question to be brief, and I could also ask the, the panelists to have a brief response as well. Uh, well, we've got a few minutes left. Is Professor Siddiq still here? Guess not. Um, uh, Michael Kep, you have uh, a couple of questions there around um, how, uh, how do you suggest to build a strong collection of seamlessly connected BI solutions? If anyone would like to answer that question. So what Michael's saying is there are plenty of BI software in the market. Uh, now the challenge is not so much about finding the right software, but making it all work together. Now, how do you build a, a collection of seamlessly connected BI solutions? Yeah, like uh, he mentioned that there are plenty of BI softwares. Yeah, so that's exactly what I was, where I was coming from. I mean, if, like he's very right. And if you have just SMS marketing or a plain, like an email marketing, it really doesn't work. Like if you just, it'll be like taken as spam or junk by the customer. If you're just talking to them, dear customer, uh, you know, uh, your, your policy is due for renewal. I mean, nobody would even listen to you or read you. So uh, this marketing platform I was talking about is talking it's like hyper personalized, right? It's talking to you, uh, uh, dear Sonal. You visited us yesterday. Thank you for uh, you know visiting us, and we would love to give you a loyalty discount of five percent on your next purchase. And if you refer a friend to us, we give you another ten percent. So you're talking to that person. You're talking in the channel that he wants to. So maybe SMS is he doesn't even read his SMSs. Maybe he's more apt with social media. So uh, this platform through AI intelligence will actually tell you after a month or two that uh, where exactly this person visits which channel frequently. Is it SMS? Is it Facebook? Is it Instagram? And then accordingly, you, uh, you know, change the system in such a way uh, from back end that you are only talking to that group of people on Instagram because Instagram is what they need, you know, where they actually are. So like the, the, the touch points, it's where you reach out to the customer where the customer is and not waiting for him to reach out to you. So this is when you actually personalize it and be there for him is exactly when your channel would work. To add I would like to, to the uh, question, um, sorry, I just wanted to quickly add here. I think it's very important because the question, as I understood it, was also around how do you really select? How do you really integrate? How do you really go after which one or not? For me, the brief, is very important and the ambition of what value you want to add for your guests because I understand and I've faced this we recently faced in the past six months there were so many CDPs that were without naming anyone but there were so many CDPs that we were considering the important thing is how much value are you and you for this you have to be clear from a brief stage that what you really want to achieve for your guests what value to add and then you can simply see all the services that you're getting Someone will give you automated offers. Someone will not give you automated dynamic offers. Someone will give you any other. So these features and capabilities all depend on what value you want to add during the customer journey. Again, the I think the onus goes on the business team in defining the brief on what we really want to achieve. Thanks, Adil. Um, I guess, Prajul, you wanted to make a point there. We're out of time also, so I guess this might be... Yeah, I just wanted to add, I mean, I think... Uh... Uh, like Adil also mentioned, it's important to understand your your goal on what is that you want to achieve, and uh, uh, through that, I think you can create a, a better picture on you know how to go about it. And then, yes, in the market there are so many tools these days which is available. Like Sonal mentioned, email marketing. I think it's it's slowly getting out of the pictures, and SMS marketing, uh, which is again moving away. 
which is worked out for us uh, quite good is the uh, uh, is the whatsapp marketing which is playing a big role which is actually leading a lot of conversation because uh, i i think among you if you just check your phone now you could have uh, so many unread sms which you hardly check what's what sms you're getting so when it comes to whatsapp i think everyone is on whatsapp everyone is checking what's uh, what's the messages you're getting so a lot of companies are moving into a uh, whatsapp ma- uh, marketing in fact uh, recently i came across a tool which is uh, which is basically trying to reduce the amount of time people want to come to the hospital and spend their time in terms of report so the ai system for whatsapp is completely going to let's say you ask for a report and then within 15 seconds the report is going to come back uh, on a pdf version come to you so these kind of things are you know uh, slowly changing everything at the same time i think you do need to test and try out uh, these platform to understand which can be your better fit depending on what's your goal thanks for your um i guess we are out of time can't believe that's a whole hour and uh, we could talk about data uh, and Oana and i could talk about data for days i think we could have uh, used another hour <laughs> yeah um so yeah i just like to say thank you to the the panel for all your great contributions um and hopefully you've made some good connections and and so on through the chat and uh, through contacts in the audience I'd also like to thank the audience for for listening in hopefully that was an exciting and interesting session at the end of the week um for everyone and um apologies if we didn't get to your question just ran out of time um as you know so thank you all <laughs>